Welcome back to Temple Jam. This is Yitzhak Ruvain with Abba Horowitz speaking from the Temple Institute here in Jerusalem, Israel. And we're going to be answering another question from a listener today. And if you have a question about the Holy Temple, uh, don't be shy. Please send it to us and we'll do our best to answer it in a future show. The best way to, for me to see it is if you go to our website, templeinstitute.org and go to the uh, contact page and send me a an email and I will see it and we'll do our best to answer it. So, today, the question is, I'm going to paraphrase, the question was about the Ketorot, about the incense. And as we know, uh, the Torah itself only mentions four ingredients. Correct. But ultimately there were 11 ingredients that went into it and the person asks, uh, I think a specific question was, how did the rabbis decide about the last three ingredients? But I think the question, I'm going to modify the question, how did they decide about the last eight ingredients? And I'm going to allow Abba to answer this question. Okay, thank you for that question. I think it's actually, just to correct it, I think it's... Uh, um, seven ingredients because four mentioned uh, four and, and it was seven, total right. 11. My math was off, yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, yeah, so it's uh, the seven ingredients. It's actually a very good question and um, I actually just want to tell everyone there's a really amazing book on the Ketorah in English written by Avram Sands from the Karlebach Moshav. He's an expert in making actually scents. Uh, he makes all kinds of uh, oils from these different uh, uh, flowers and it's considered one of the pure sources of these uh, essential oils and he actually knows a lot about the plants that go into the Qatarit and he wrote a book on it actually that includes many of the ideas on the Qatarit and explains them really really well. Um, you know one thing is that I, I think you'll agree with me uh, Yitzchak, the Qatarit wasn't just a formulation it was also created spiritual and you know, smell is very spiritual. The idea of smell in general is a spiritual idea. It's the only chush, the only sense that Adam and, and Eve right. did not use when they sinned. So we still retain this right. amazing sense. When, uh, when they, the Torah itself, and the, the story of eating of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, it mentions that they saw it, it looked beautiful, it tasted good, it felt good. Um, and uh, they heard the snake, the Correct. serpent. So that was the, the, the fourth of the five senses. But smell, which is very interesting because smell is such an important component of taste, but they did not mention smell. So smell retained its purity. It was never tainted by, by the sin, the chit of Adam and, and Eve. And so it became the incense in, in the temple was they say is the most beloved of all the offerings to Hashem because it was just pure spirituality. And to add to that, you know, think about it. That was what was brought to the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. Yes, yeah. Nothing else. Yeah. Something that radiated a smell as opposed to any other korban, and it makes a lot of sense because it was our one way, our one pathway of spiritually connecting to the other world was through smell. Mm -hmm. We still retain that ability yeah. to go back to Gan Eden. Yeah. So I, I think that's very important. So again, the 11 uh, smells, there's a lot of Kabbalah on this, just so you should know. There's a tremendous amount of, of stuff written on this. If someone wants to, it can, if you can get the Sidur of the Shlach HaKodesh, he talks a lot about the importance of the Qataret and what goes into it. But there's a lot of books on it. Mechon Mikdash also has uh, Rav Makaver, uh, in one of his books, Oro Shel Mikdash, I think it's called, mm -hmm. uh, he talks a lot about the Qatar as well and the different spices and the different that went into it. I'd also say on our website, uh, templeinstitute.org, we have an entire section dedicated to the Qatar uh, incense with a lot of information there and a lot of pictures that uh, I encourage everybody to go and have a look. And I'm just going to throw this out whenever, you know, I say the Qatar twice a day at least uh, during Shacharit, the morning prayers and the afternoon prayers. Many people do that. It's very, very important to say it provides a protect protection for you. There's a lot of Zohars on how much protection saying the Qatar alone. Yeah. Imagine if we actually offered it. Right. And in fact, the Kohanim, the, the temple priests that did offer it, it was such a desirable offering yes, that yeah. they would, every day in, 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 the, in the temple, in the morning, there would be a lottery in which they would 
a lot the different assignments of different kohanim, but only a kohen was only allowed to bring the the ketorot offering once in a lifetime, so that everybody would have an opportunity to do it because it was. Uh, a very, very uh, desirable offering to bring. It brought him a lot of mazel, the person, a lot of, you know, good, good fortune, fortune to yeah. the person who actually brought it. Which is why we say the Torah today, and in fact it's even a tradition to say the Torah incense offering description on, written on cloth, written on, on uh, actual uh, Hide yeah. that we the same correct. There are those who are based on I think it's a chida, the one of the uh, late scholars of the uh, Sephardi scholars of the 1800s. Uh, he actually said that there's a special that one should have it on on a scroll cloth. Mm -hmm. um, but I think even if you don't, yeah, you know, one can can just say, just saying the words I think are magical, and they again saying any words of God's words are going to be magical and create certain energies mm -hmm. that are going to be helpful to anybody. Okay, so let's get on with the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now that we went on this whole sidetracking thing. Okay, so the answer is, first of all, the Gemara in Kritut, in Tracte Kritut on the sixth page, is what uh, brings the famous Breita, the famous words of the Tanaim about the different uh, spices that actually went into the Qatar. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second for people who aren't familiar with the words you're using. Gemara is another word for a Talmud, Talmud really. Yes. And, and, and uh, the Tanaim were, were scholars of the Mishnah. Of the, Mish the second, first, second century Se CE. Second century Correct. CE. Pre destruction of temple to post destruction of the okay, temple. Right, right. Another 150 years actually afterwards, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Okay. So we get an idea. These were the scholars that wrote the Mishnah, and then which subsequently followed with the Talmud, which was at a later date. All this pretty much finished around, I think it was 550 or so, mm -hmm. 500, 550, is pretty much it was the end of that, and then we went into the Gaonic period. Not to belabor the point. So, so actually on this Gemara, there's a lot of different commentators, um, and I'm gonna give you the bottom line, and then I'll just throw something else out, out there afterwards. The bottom line is that these 11 spices, according to most commentators like the Rambam and Maimonides and Ramban Nachmanides, um, both of them believe that it was essentially given to Moshe and Har Sinai. That we were, Moshe was told, here are the 11 spices, this is what you need to do. Um, and those were the 11 spices that were given today. However, the Ramban, Nachmanides, brings two other uh, positions. Essentially that you essentially can have a choice you know, potentially on certain of the spices. There are those who say that you can own the first four that are named in the Bible in Shemot, in Exodus. Exodus, those you can't change. The other seven, which were uh, uh, mentioned in the Brita, in that Tanaic source, you can actually change. Um, Rashi, from Rashi itself, it seems that um, all of them can be changed. Rashi's actually quoting, and, and I'll quote it to you, is actually on that Gemara, on that Talmud, Talmudic source, in Tractate Kritu, it actually says, uh, and I'm going to quote it, Velonik vu ela dalid, meaning only four of them were told in the Torah. And listen to Rashi, what Rashi says. Vekol yud alev de boy nesi. You can actually bring any 11 that you want. Ubilvad she koter ve'ole. As long as it goes up in smoke in a nice form, that's good enough. So he was saying 11 different ingredients is essential, but they can be... Any 11? It would seem to be that's the case according to Rashi over interesting. there. Interesting. Okay. And um, so that's, that's interesting on its own. But it seems that most have accepted that the 11 spices were Halakha the Moshe Messinai or given to Moshe on Har Sinai uh, on, on the mountain of Sinai. And that these are the 11 specific spices that were allowed to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Ramban actually brings an interesting idea that, you know, it could be that it has a lot to do with the spices of the Shem and Hamishcha also, that that's included uh, the, the, the anointing, oil. anointing oil, you know, because it, it's actually mentioned before the Ketarit, yeah. so perhaps it's connected to that. Uh, there's also in Shira Shirim and Song of Songs, there's a whole bunch of spices that are mentioned right. that we see are actually incorporated into the Ketarit. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and um, Karkum, Kurkum mm -hmm. is one of them, which we also know is a wonderful spice for your bones and yeah. healing and all, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh, I take it almost every day. I take mm -hmm. curcum. Um, sometimes I just put it into my tea or I actually take a pill. Uh, all these spices are important. And as you can imagine, these are, these are grown by God. God decided to grow all these spices, yeah. right? So they all have a purpose. As the Rambam Maimonides says in his uh, intro to Mishnah, he says that every plant that God put in this world has a to'elet, has a benefit for mankind, has a usage for mankind. 
Um, and, and that has to do with also these 11 spices as well. Um, and so we try. One of the biggest problems, as you know, Yitzchak, is now identifying right, right. correctly what That's are these right. 11 spices. Yeah. Some of them are pretty easy to figure out, and others, there's more of a dispute as to what they really are. In Mechon Migdash's book, Temple Institute, Temple Institute's <laughs> book, um, <laughs> and they, they put out a um, tractate Yuma, which has to do with Yom Kippur, and in the back of that book, they actually have the pictures of the spices, and you know, the Ramban, Nachmanides holds certain spices right. are sp- specific, you know, to these plants, and and uh, the Ramban Maimonides holds others. So it's unclear. There seems to be somewhat of a dispute in certain of the plants. Um, there's even here's another dispute: is you know, there's certain one one that actually seems like it comes from a non-kosher animal potentially right. could that be are we putting a non-kosher animals you know an essence from that non-kosher animal into the migdash or not there's all these different disputes of where these different plants plants or spices come from you know oh, yeah, smelling okay. i the, the shechilet i think is uh many people feel it's uh from a shellfish correct so, so is so that true could that be you know um, so that is uh, certainly a non-kosher a food, but of course, the the, the it's uh, called the murex and flutus. Yeah, we also Just use a, a snail. In if the, in if the that makes it easier for people, in the blue dye for the tequila. That's correct. That's called murex trunculus. Uh, very good. I know your Latin. <laughs> Thank uh, you. That's about the only course, two Latin words I know. <laughs> and that tequila blue is used extensively in in the in the uh, Kohen Gadol and the high priest garments correct. and in, in the the mikdash itself. So we're not eating them, but apparently uh, we certainly can. Uh, get the uh, hana out of them or pleasure out of them or certainly they can have a spiritual purpose in the mikdash in the holy temple so we as you said there are disputes over what the different ingredients are referring to as time goes by and this is a similar thing with with the stones in the in the breastplate of the high priest as times go by the same words are used in different eras for different things. We discovered that when, when the Temple Institute was doing the research to discover which the, st- the 12 stones were in the, on the high priest's uh, breastplate, and something that was, that was called uh, Shoham at one point in history, later on was sure. uh, referred to a different stone. And so you have to do a lot of uh, sleuthing, a lot of detective work to find these things out. There are some real experts today, uh, currently, who, who are very involved in trying to identify the the ingredients of the of the ketoret. Yes, there's a professor Amar, yeah, who's, who's a uh, uh, a big uh, big scholar. He's a religious Jew who's also a professor in Bar Ilan, I believe, and he's actually written both on the stones of the breastplate. And also he has a book called Ketaret that's uh, actually yeah. on the Ketaret. And he also has written about the different uh, dyes, how they created the Chelet and how they Correct. created the Argaman and uh, fascinating stuff. And it's really a whole field of research that has come alive today in our time because we're back in the land of Israel and the temple is, is it's a reality. time of redemption. Yeah, so and so these things that were kind of you know, neglected for thousands of years because it wasn't about to happen except by some kind of divine fiat, some thought. But, you know, we understand it's up to us. And being that it's up to us, we have to figure it out. And so, you know, things that you said before, you know, uh, like the, what the Rashi said, you know, it could be any 11, um, which I don't think we hold by that. But I take that in, in context. And I connect it to another uh, expression you use. I don't know if it was this show or earlier show that we do the best we can. And so, you know, God forbid we shouldn't not have a temple because we can't figure out what that 11th ingredient is in the Torah. We'll do the best we can. And if we discover afterwards that, you know, it was something else, we'll make the switch. Again, this is what... It's our Gemara, actually, if I may interject here, in Bechorot that has to do with the temple. Because Hashem, when he gave the measurements for the ark and the altar, they were specific measurements. Mm-hmm. But the Gemara then asks, "If Charlotte sounds same, we can't be so exact to make it perfectly one and a half amot mm-hmm. 
cubits mm -hmm. by, let's say, right. one ama. How, we can't do that. Man is not capable of being, I mean, today it's a little bit different because we have computers and we have technology. But in those days, they couldn't right. be so specific. And also your tefillin, when you make your tefillin, how could you be so specific to yeah. make it exactly square in those days? So the Gemara there says, actually, you do the best you can. Yeah. You do what Hashem told you, and whatever you do, koma uh, avid mahani, whatever you do, it helps, it works. And, and I think that's what our attitude is. We got to do, you don't just say, oh, you know, I'm not, it's not going to be perfect, so I'm not doing the mitzvah. Right, that's neurotic. Exactly. <laughs> and, that's, that's, and that is a, a common element, I think, in, in yes. many attitudes today that we don't know exactly, we don't know, you know, precisely, so stay away from it. No. God wants us to come as close as we can. Asuli, Asuli Mikdash, build for me a temple. God wants it for him. He wants us to do it for him. So he's not creating something that's going to be impossible for us to do. That's... No, no commandment is exactly. impossible. You do the very best you can, and if a new technology comes into the world or new knowledge, you take it from there and you move on. It, we we talked about that in an earlier show with with the the idea of the, uh, the Ezekiel's temple. You know, they took what they could figure out and they incorporated it into the second temple. And if someday someone has ruach hakodesh, has this uh, inspiration, then we'll take it from there. And again, just to circle around, we're talking earlier show about Elul, and we're still in the month of Elul, and perfecting ourselves, you know, making ourselves better. We try to do our best, and we have to accept the fact that God's going to accept us, however we are, who we are, as long as we're trying to do our best. That's what God wants from us. I, I couldn't agree more. I think people always have to remember, you know, there's a thing that, it's, it's called Jewish guilt. We're always <laughs> feeling guilty about things. And Chodesh Ella, people walk and go, wow, I did so many sins, I did this and that. Well, you have to remember at the end of the day, Hashem Hashem Kerachem Vachana. God is merciful. He loves us. We're His children. And, you know, He's going to forgive us. And, and I think that's why it's so important the Bible that when you read the five books of Moses, you know, Hamisha Chum Shaitara, what you see is Am Yisrael keeps on sinning. Yeah, they screw up left and right. All the time. They're messing up. But the point being is Hashem is merciful. He takes us back every time. And, and I think we have to remember, God loves us. And it's very, very important to understand that concept because a lot of people, they do a lot of things in the religion out of guilt. And that's not mm -hmm. what God wants. God doesn't want out of guilt. He wants it out of love. He wants it because He loves us and He wants us to love Him. And that's actually the first commandment in Shema, right? Be'afta es Hashem elokecha, you got to love Hashem, mm -hmm. right? And the idea is you have to understand, it's just as we need to love Him, He loves us. He has no ego. He's not like us. And, you know, we go to the temple, Three times a year, you go there to to see and be seen by Hashem. Correct. God wants us to be. He wants us wants us to be there. Calls the to be present. Everybody. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. Just, just be there. Sinners too. show up. Show Sinners up. Sinners too them. are welcome. Show up for life. Exactly. Okay. With that, we're going to sign off for today. Right. Thank you so much, Temple Jam. <laughs>